Oh, go ahead. Our mission. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shining light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious background, and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at this meeting is voluntary, and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. However, these Zoom meetings are very helpful to parents all around the world, and they are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members who are not able to attend this live meeting can also watch. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Bill, and thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you so much. And I just want to remind everyone to please put your name, where you're from, if you're a caring listener, if you are an affiliate leader or a board member in the chat box. Um, well, I am going ahead and just telling a little bit about Bill so that you guys will understand. Um, I I've known both Bill and Susan for quite some time. And I feel very fortunate because they had a home here in Scottsdale for a long time and they would make the trip between Calgary and Scottsdale. So they're, they're both wonderful people. Bill Van Oyge is just an ordinary guy who has had extraordinary things happen to him because of the passing of his son six and a half years ago. Before his 27 year old son's passing from the effects of drug abuse, it was all about willpower for Bill but it turns out it's all about surrender. And once Bill surrendered, the miracles started to pour into his life. Greg has opened up the universe for his dad in so many ways, and he has made it abundantly clear that he's still right here. Vivid dreams, messages during waking hours, signs and synchronicities came thick and fast as his son worked over time in his excitement to share the beautiful place he now calls home and it continues to this day. Bill quickly learned, although he had a hard time believing it sometimes, that although he was one of the most unlikely candidates, he was gifted with abilities to see, hear, and even touch his son and others who have passed before him and to receive messages from the other side that are all about love and oneness. <clears throat> astral projection, automatic writing, and messages from his guides who call themselves the ancients are just a few of the beautiful and life-changing events that Bill experiences. He now knows beyond a shadow of any doubt that we are light, we are love, and we are eternal. He has been transformed. Born and raised in Gulf, Ontario, Canada, Bill moved out west after university to Calgary, Alberta and met his wife, Susan. They have two beautiful children, their daughter, Kristen, that I've also met, she's wonderful, and their son in spirit, Greg. While spending winters in Scottsdale, Arizona, it turns out that the Canadian snow, snowbirds wet were at ground zero for helping parents heal, something they now know was not a coincidence. They attended Elizabeth Vini Boisson's meetings at Unity of Phoenix uh, Spiritual Center and Carol Santa Allen's meetings in Cave Creek and the first Helping Parents Heal conference as well. Now in Canada full time, this shining light dad was nudged by his son in spirit to start the Calgary chapter of Helping Parents Heal. The chapter Zoom meetings are held the third Tuesday of every month. Bill and Susan are co-affiliate leaders, and they are so pleased to offer parents who are suffering with grief the knowledge that our children who have passed are gone only in body, and someday we will see them again. 
And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bill Van Oyge. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Irene, for the invitation. Uh, just thinking as I was, uh, you know, listening to you that there probably isn't really much left to say. Um, this is going to be what I'm going to be talking about here. But uh, I want to say that, you know, what our son Greg has shown us from the other side has been absolutely miraculous and just beautiful. You know, it has helped in healing myself and Susan and my daughter, Kristen. And my daughter, Kristen, is still in regular contact with her brother, Greg. In fact, they are closer now than they've ever been. And uh, he is guiding and helping her all the time. I want to share a small portion, you know, of the journey that I've had uh, with Greg's transition and how it can give hope and help to anyone who's listening. And if that is, you know, the purpose of this and someone gets that from listening to this, then we've accomplished our mission here. Um, I have had, you know, what some people would refer to as, you know, near death experiences in the sense that when I look at what people who have gone through a near death experience have gone through and what I have gone through is very, very similar except that I didn't need to die in order to get these experiences. So I look at my situation as being a spiritually transformative, you know, experience. And that has really changed me completely as a person. Susan was a, a reporter. Uh, we met at the Calgary Herald when I was uh, working there. And she has recorded everything that has happened to us over the last six and a half years. And we have over 1,700 entries in our notes that she's kept. Uh, and it's, you know, all kinds of things. It's, it's astral, you know, projections that I've been, you know, through. It's, um, you know, listening to Greg during waking hours and hearing him. It's, you know, been able to, you know, have the synchronicities that we see and dreams that I've had. You know, so it comes in all kinds of varying forms, you know, as far as the experience is concerned. And uh, like I said, again, it's just been absolutely miraculous. You know, I'll give you a little bit of a history about myself. My parents moved to Canada after World War II in the 50s. And I was born in Canada. My sister was born in Holland where they were Dutch. And we spoke Dutch at, at home. And so, you know, I always felt a little isolated, you know, from the Canadian culture. And my mom's motto was always that if you put your mind to it and you can, you know, really believe that you can accomplish something, you can accomplish anything. And she used to say, it's just sheer willpower that will get you through, you know. And as a young kid, I was really quite doted upon by my mom. She really spoiled me. And I thought I could do no wrong, you know? So, you know, you grow up thinking that and it leads to certain behavioral characteristics, you know? And I, I guess what I used to tell people is that, you know, it was my bus and I drove it and I was not raised in any kind of religion and I didn't have a strong spirituality. It was just Bill Van Oy going through the world, you know, and I, you know, used to say, it's my bus, I will drive it. And, and every once in a while, when I get into trouble, I would say, well, you know, maybe God should take over for this few minutes here and, and drive the bus, but it was my bus, you know, so I ended up going to university, I ended up moving out west to Canada, uh, Alberta, Canada, you know, from uh, Ontario, and uh, started uh, getting into human resources and worked my way up to the director of human resources at the Calgary Herald and had several other positions. You know, things were going well. I met Susan. We were, you know, ready to start a family. And uh, we had Greg. And three years later, we had Kristen. And things looked pretty good. Um, you know, we traveled a lot. We had the cars. We had the houses. You know, it was just really, you know, very normal 
you know, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And, you know, my mom and dad lived here in Calgary and, and uh, from there, you know, we were just living the day-to-day -day life of raising a family and going to work, you know. As we got uh, a little farther along, you know, I was about 38 years of age and uh, I had probably always been a, quite a heavy drinker, you know, and I thought to myself, this is not really going well. And I decided that I was going to quit drinking. So I have celebrated my 29th year of sobriety, you know, so I'm proud of that. That was just back in January 30th of this year, but nothing really changed. You know, I, I didn't drink, but anybody who's had any experience with people who do drink and who have a certain amount of willpower, you know, it's not the most pleasant person to be around, you know, and that was me. You know, I was angry and I was, uh, you know, very judgmental. I was very caught up in myself, very narcissistic. And, uh, you know, I just did not really like this place. You know, I didn't like people. I didn't really, you know, I was in human resources. And to me, you know, that was really not a people's job. You know, you were there more or less firing people left, right and center, you know, especially during the 70s or the 80s and 90s. And, you know, I really didn't uh, relate to the job at all. So, you know, there I was wondering what I was going to be doing with the rest of my life. I didn't really enjoy my job. And, you know, we had pretty much done everything. And I, you know, I thought to myself, well, I'm not sure I really want to continue really doing this anymore. And I really didn't know what the answer was, you know, and I was lost, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, moving forward then, you know, Greg, he was uh, a very, very ambitious child, you know, like, uh, well, not ambitious in getting things done, but ambitious to have fun. You know, that's all he really wanted, you know, was to have fun. And it didn't matter the consequences, you know, and Greg would just do whatever he wanted to do. And, and, and he was very, very uh, hyper. You know, Greg was a very loving boy. He uh, was uh, very uh, loved by everyone else. And, you know, he was the type of person that, you know, you could never really get a handle on as to what he was up to. You know, Sue used to say it was like trying to uh, hammer jello to a wall, you know, with Greg, you know, and uh, it was just a really hard, hard, you know, kind of thing to manage. He, he would sneak out in the middle of the night, just go out his bedroom, you know, and we didn't even know he was gone. You know, he would do all, anything that he felt like doing whenever he felt like doing it, you know, and yet he was just a sweet, sweet person and really, really smart, but he was lost, you know, and he didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life. Now, Greg didn't really get involved at all in any kind of drugs or anything until he was well into his 21st, you know, birthday. And at that point, you know, he found marijuana and he smoked it like an Olympian, you know, like, and people will say, well, you know, it's just marijuana. In fact, I, you know, I, uh, having been in, in AA and having gone to AA meetings, people would always say, you know, oh, well, marijuana can't hurt you. In fact, in Canada, we've legalized it. And some of your states are now starting to legalize it. And people say, oh, yeah, well, it's not crack. It's not heroin. You know, it's not meth. You know, it's just pot, right? But if you smoke it like the way Greg smoked it, it got him into trouble and it became extremely toxic for him. And we noticed that he wasn't doing well, you know, at all with, and we didn't know why he wasn't doing well, you know, and uh, he would get sick and he would just, uh, you know, not, not, not be himself. And he was never, ever, you know, uh, able to come over when he said he was going to be over. And we, I really thought there was something wrong. So finally we intervened and, you know, while we didn't intervene, actually Greg came to me and said, I need help dad. And we sent him away to a recovery center and he went away for about six weeks. And we, I was in Arizona at the time and I flew back home and I tried to help Greg. And, um, you know, I thought that if anybody could help Greg, it would be me because I'd had experience with, with addiction. 
So Greg ended up, you know, uh, coming out of that recovery center. He was fine for a while and then he relapsed and he got really, really sick. And I flew back home again for him. He had uh, gotten into trouble up here and uh, I ended up, you know, meeting with him and getting him involved in some meetings up here. We got him a sponsor. We got him into a sober house and he was living there and we got him all set up and I thought, okay, and we went, I went back down uh, to um, meet with Susan. And uh, I thought he was going to be doing okay with all of the support that I had given him. But Greg, again, relapsed. And we didn't really know how badly he had relapsed. He was working as an apprentice up north uh, for the oil patch as an electrician. And he was going to, you know, pursue that. And we thought he was up north working and doing okay. And... I thought to myself, there's something wrong. I just had this premonition that there was something wrong and that it wasn't going well. So in August uh, of that year, we didn't know that, but he had been fired from his job up north and he had gone back to the sober house. And when he got sick, he would tell people that he was just not feeling well. And uh, it actually made him so sick that he would get, he would throw up and, and uh, he actually ended up doing that. Uh, over a three-day period on a weekend, and he got so sick and so badly uh, dehydrated that he actually ended up passing away uh, at the side of his bed in a sober house. And uh, there's actually a name for what he died from, and it's called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And now they're starting to realize in hospitals that a lot of people are starting to come down with this because of the legalization of pot. But going past that, you know, I remember the police coming over here that evening and they told us that they had found Greg in the sober house and he had passed away. And of course, it just hits you like a brick. And I just couldn't believe it. You just go into absolute shock, you know. And I thought, if anything, I could have saved him. But I now realize that it wasn't me who was going to be able to save Greg. It was only going to be Greg who could save Greg. And he didn't have that intention. You know, so, you know, there, there we were sitting in the kitchen here with those two police officers. And I thought, that's it. You know, I don't know what to do anymore. I really had gotten to that point in my life where I really felt like I didn't want to be here myself anymore. You know, but I didn't ever think of suicide. You know, I was just going to gut it out because that's what you do down here. You just gut it out, you know, and now my son was dead. Susan had had breast cancer uh, prior to that, you know, and that's how we actually ended up in Scottsdale is because we went to the Mayo Clinic in, in Scottsdale and she had her treatment there. And I ended up having three months before Greg's passing a heart attack. And I remember Susan saying to me at the time, Bill, has anything changed? And I said to myself, no, nothing's changed, Sue. This place is still a crap hole, and I always will think that, and nothing's going to ever change that. You know, and so she says, well, that's too bad, because when she had had her cancer, she had actually had a spiritual experience out of it, and she felt changed. Me, that didn't happen. So Greg's dead, and I think to myself, I don't want to be here anymore. And I was just so broken and absolutely torn, torn apart that I couldn't imagine going on anymore. And it was at that moment that I just dropped to my knees and I just said to God, help me, help me, please. You know, and I don't know what caused me to do that, but it happened, you know, and I look back now and I think to myself, you know, there's probably nothing more horrific. I mean, they could have done anything to me, but there's nothing more horrific than losing a child, you know? And it was just absolutely devastating. And when that moment happened, I could have taken two roads. One road was obviously to more anger, more frustration, more hatred, more, more of the negative. And instead, I asked for help. And it was when I asked for help that all the miracles just started pouring in. It was just unbelievable. 
Now I've been through AA and the whole concept behind AA is surrender, you know, and it's spiritually based and they always tell you about a higher power. And I believed in a higher power. And when I use the term God, you know, you can look at that and say, okay, I use the term God, or you can say higher power, or you can say the source, or you can say the divine, but there's something greater than yourself. And I never really embraced that. You know, until that moment when Greg passed away, you know, and that's when really it started to happen. I remember saying to Kristen and Susan at the time, I'm not going to do anything, Susan, Kristen, we're just going to put this behind us and we're just going to move on, you know, and I didn't, and they all said, well, we have to have some kind of a gathering. We have to have some kind of a, you know, a a celebration. And I said, no, I don't want to do any of that. I, I just want to forget that this ever happened, you know. I went to bed that night, you know, and I woke up the next day and I thought, again, God help me. Please help me. I can't get through this, you know. That following night it was two days in and Greg came to me that evening in my bedroom. And he said to me at the time, and I could see his outline in the bedroom. He was... Uh, like a figure and it was gray and he had yellow coloring and green coloring and I could see his aura and I remember uh, falling asleep and hearing his voice and he came to me and he said dad don't do anything on my behalf don't have a gathering or a scattering of my ashes you know don't do it for me do it for you reach out to all my friends and their love and they will help you through. So I woke up that morning and I came downstairs and I said, I had Greg come visit me. Susan couldn't believe it. She was distraught. She was absolutely torn apart, you know? And uh, I said, yeah. And Kristen said, will you reconsider dad? And I said, okay, I'll reconsider. Maybe we should do something, you know? And that's when it started to happen. You know, I had, uh, you know, not really understood to the extent that Greg was going to start changing my life at that point. But three days later, Susan was having a real hard time of it. She had left the bedroom that night. She had gone into the other bedroom. She would, could not sleep. She was just distraught. She felt guilt. She wanted, you know, some kind of sign from Greg. And She finally came back into the bedroom about five. I had woken up when she came back in, gone to the bathroom, came back in. We laid down. I said, Sue, I'm tired. I'm going to go back to sleep. I hope you can sleep. She stayed there and she wasn't sleeping. And I fell right back asleep. But five minutes later, after being in a deep sleep, I wake up out of that sleep, just startled. And I grabbed Susan's leg quick. And she thought I was comforting her, but I wasn't. I was telling her that Greg had just come to me. And I said to her, he's here, right? She sat up in the bed. I sat up in the bed. We looked over at the shutters in our bedroom. And if we didn't see a light show start, okay? And it was unbelievable. There was a section in our our, uh, window and the shutters about a foot, uh, two feet, by one feet and all of a sudden we saw this bright shining light in there and not only did I see it but Susan saw it we were watching it together and we live on the back of a park where it's all dark there's no lights no cars no nothing nothing could have shone through there it was just this light and it was waving off in the distance you know and it was going faster and faster and faster and then it broke up into six lines And those six lines were uh, two lines of what looked like eyes, you know, like a a cat, a cat eye. And there were two lines of X's and two lines of O's. And then it just kept streaming across the window. And then it just ended and it went all through the sky, just like little particles of light beams. And it ended and it lasted for about 10 to 15 seconds. And we couldn't believe what we had seen. So Susan felt right away, Greg answered her prayers. Okay, so that started some healing for her. 
you know, and uh, that situation continued. And it was like pages and a book. It, they just kept, you know, turning as time went on. Because later on, what we were doing is we were wondering what these eyes were that were in this light show that we had seen in our bedroom. And I thought a cat's eye, you know, is it Egyptian? What could it possibly be? And we couldn't come to any terms, you know, as to what it could possibly be until we went to Scottsdale that following winter. And I was laying in bed in Scottsdale and I had another dream. And Greg came to me in this dream. And I saw in my dream, the cat's eye with the, with the, with the eye in the middle. Uh, and it was just like that. And then I saw that disappear and it was black and white with nothing else. And then I saw the word I, E-Y-E -E, spelled out. And then that went away. Then I saw another little sentence pop up and it says, I see you. And that went away. And then another sentence came up and it said, I see everything. And then that went away. And then I woke up out of this dream. Now I'd always dreamed really vividly and very lucid when I was a child, but my dreams were always extremely violent all my life. And I think it's because of the energy that I was pulling in, you know, because they are, they say, you know, that all the time now. And that's what I've learned is that you are what you think and you are what you feel. And if you're putting negative stuff out there, you're getting negative stuff coming back. And that's the kind of people that I was always encountering in my lifetime. So I saw that and I said to Sue, look what Greg just showed me, part of the light show. I see you, you know, I see everything. So that was just confirmation again that Greg was here with us. You know, a couple of years later, I'm sitting in Scottsdale again and I hear Greg say, go to Costco. And I go, what? Because by now, Greg is coming through to me on a regular basis. He said, go to, Co go to Costco. So I went to go to Costco, but Susan and I was going to go for a walk. And I thought, well, I'll go to Costco and see what he wants me to go there for. I don't know. I have any idea. It was near Sue's birthday, and um, which is in February. And... I thought, okay, I'll go. And then she says, well, I'm going to go on a walk with you. And I'm like, I couldn't end up going to Costco. So I just dropped it. The next day I'm sitting at the computer again and they said, go to Costco. And I said, Greg, are you telling me to go to Costco? Go to Costco. So I said to Sue, I'm going for a walk. Are you coming this time? She said, no. So I got in the car. I quickly drove to Costco around the corner from our place. And I go in there and I thought, well, I don't know what he wants me here for. You know, so he directed me over to the jewelry case because I thought, well, if I'm going to come here, you know, and I'm going to buy something, it can't be anything clothing. It can't be anything food. It's got to be jewelry or anything if it's Sue's birthday and he wants me to go there because that's a sense I was getting from him. So I go over to the uh, glass case there and I look at at the jewelry there and I don't see anything. So I go to leave. And just before I get to the door, he talks to me again. He says, turn around and go back one more time. So I go back one more time and I go and look and I see a pair of earrings. Now, they weren't very expensive. They were $300, you know, and I thought, wow, that is really interesting. And they caught my eye because when I looked at them, they were a little box, uh, kind of 3D earrings, but they were shaped like an eye. And they were, you know, just like the dream I'd seen. So I thought, okay, well, I'll get that for Susan. You know, Greg obviously wants to buy her something. I hadn't, he had never bought her anything before because he had never had any money. And, you know, I went and checked out. I go in the car and I sit there and I look at the earrings. And sure enough, stamped in these earrings are X's and O's. You know, I wish I could see them. They're an I, X's and O's. They're just absolutely perfect. They represented the dream that we had had. So that was one of the most amazing miracles that, you know, we ended up going through. After Greg's passing, we were scheduled to go on a Mediterranean tour. Sue wanted to cancel. I said, no, let's go. You know, let's get out of here. 
It's the best thing we can do. We'll have his scattering and his gathering after we come back, you know? And uh, we went on this cruise and I ended up taking Greg's ashes with us at the time, just a little bit in a, in a vitamin jar that I put with, you know, in my suitcase. And, and we went on this Mediterranean cruise and uh, it became a pilgrimage to Greg. Now, Greg was the type of person who I said was a gamer and one of his favorite uh, games and, and uh, books that uh, he used to love was Game of Thrones. You know, when that came out, he was a big follower and he just absolutely loved it. And we had said that we were gonna go to Dubrovnik, which is where Game of Thrones was filmed. And we would take pictures for him and we would bring them back and we would show him all about the places where Game of Thrones had been filmed. And we were gonna go to Malta and, you know, King's Landing, the main gates of King's Landing were filmed in Malta at the old Templars, uh, you know, um, location there and stuff like that. So we went on this pilgrimage. We ended up in Dubrovnik walking the walls of that uh, fortress, you know, and uh, I remember Susan standing in line and she said to the ticket person, there was nobody else there buying tickets. We got there early in the morning and Susan said, two tickets, please. And the ticket guy said three. And he looked at Susan kind of like really strangely, like, why did I just say three? You know, because there's only two of you here. And I immediately thought, Greg has put that into his mind. Greg's here with us. He's gone to walk the Dubrovnik walls with us. And, you know, um, he's part of this whole thing. Now they were filming actually Game of Thrones that day while we were there. And, uh, you know, the Lannister flags were all flying there and we took pictures of them. We walked the wall and we came to this tower after having spent the morning there. And I thought, well, this is a great place where we could spread some of his ashes. And we went up to the top of the tower and I put them out the window there and we saw the ashes kind of shining in the, in the, in the sunlight and flickering and they floated down and went to the ground and, and stuff like that. Later on, we found that the name of this tower that we were in was called the Tower of the Undying Dead, okay? And so it was so appropriate that we had dropped that there and that was in Game of Thrones. So, you know, it was another indication that Greg was with us that day. So we left some of his ashes there. Then we went to Venice and I was sleeping in Venice and I got this dream that night, you know, and Greg came to us and said, I want you to go on a gondola ride. Um, I want you to take my ashes and I want you to spread them in the front of the Bridge of Sighs and that will represent my freedom, you know? So I thought, okay, so I woke up and I said to Susan, Greg came to me last night, he wants to take a gondola ride. Now, Sue had said, we'd already been to Venice once before, nine years earlier with the kids, Greg had taken our pictures on a gondola ride while we were going under the Bridge of Sighs. And, um, you know, I said, he wants us to do it again. She goes, no, really? And he even said to me jokingly, because Greg had the most wonderful sense of humor. He said, and it's on me because he had left us his life insurance policy that paid out to us after his passing. And so he had never had any money and now he had money and he was gonna tell us that it was on him, this gondola ride. So we ended up going on this thing. And I remember going just past the bridge of size. I put my hand in the water and I had some ashes in a piece of paper and I just let them float into the bay there. And uh, we you know, fulfilled Greg's dream. Of, uh, of having his ashes uh, released there and representing his freedom. So we moved on, you know, and we went to Malta and we did the same thing at the front of the gates of King's Landing that they filmed Game of Thrones from and left Greg's uh, ashes there. And then we ended up in Rome and we went to the Colosseum because he was a big football fan, Steelers fan. And uh, I said, well, what better place than to take somebody's light and put it into a dark place like the Colosseum, you know, and bring some light into that place because of all the things that had happened over history at, at the Colosseum. And it's probably the most famous uh, kind of stadium that you can imagine in the whole world. So being a football fan, we thought that that would be appropriate for us to do that. So we left some of his ashes there. 
And the whole thing was just amazing. You know, like when we were on deck at the ship on the ship, you know, they would play the Game of Thrones music on the deck while we were sitting on our balcony. You know, things like that just kept happening over and over and over again. You know, so finally we get home and Kristen was here and you know, she was glad to see us again. And we had his gathering and his scattering, you know, while we were here and all his friends showed up and it was just a wonderful thing. And we went down to a, a little park where he used to play all the time. That's a provincial park, just about a half an hour walk from our house. And we uh, left his ashes down there. It couldn't be more appropriate because that's where he always played with his friends. And uh, it was a wonderful thing. So, you know, all of the miracles at that point in time, you know, just kept coming. You know, it just, you know, to have 1700, you know, I figured it out the other day over six and a half years, you know, that works out to about one every two or three days, you know, and, uh, you know, when you start thinking about it that way, you know, it's just mind boggling. And, you know, never did I think that I would ever be subjected to anything like this you know, and have all these kind of beautiful things happen to me. Not much later than that, uh, longer past that uh, point of time, I ended up having another dream. And I guess I was in Arizona at the time for this one too. And I remember Greg coming to me and he told me at that time in the dream, and I saw the words written out again. And I got up after the dream and I wrote them down exactly as I remembered them when I had seen them in the dream. And he told me at that point, I am okay. Okay, I am. Now, he was a huge Star Wars fan, you know. And so after uh, they, it said, I am okay, okay, I am, he said, Yoda speaks, right? So I knew it was him, you know. And uh, then he said, I am in the cosmos, that went away. I saw that in writing. Then that went away. And I saw in big black letters, I am reviewing with the higher powers. Then that went away, you know, and uh, 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 up came some words. And, and these words were just absolutely amazing. He said, I am with him, not too close, but near. And I knew at that moment he was referring to God, you know, and I thought to myself, what a lucky guy, you know, he is up there, he is doing his review with his guides, and he is near God, not too close, but near, you know, so I got up and wrote that down and my and Susan just said, Oh, my, this is just absolutely crazy, you know. A little while later, Greg came to me in a dream too, you know, and I remember this so beautifully. I had gone and I did this a lot with him. I had gone out into outer space. We used to look at the earth. Now, Greg was a real fan when he was down here on earth. He always looked at the, at, at the stars, you know, and we would lay in our back park here behind our house in a green belt that we have and would just spend hours looking up as if he knew where he came from, you know, and I remember going into space and Greg came to me and it was just beautiful blue crystal star. It was almost like it was made out of glass. It was just beautifully, uh, um, it was like crystal and it was just emanating this love and this healing. And I immediately knew it was Greg. And he said to me, dad, I am a star. And I said, oh, Greg, you are so beautiful. And I started to cry. And he says, don't cry, Dad. He says, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking now that I'm a star, I'm going away. And I won't be here anymore for you. And he says, that will never happen. He says, I will always be here for you. And again, I woke up out of that dream. And Susan wrote it down. You know, And I said, you know, like Sue sometimes makes fun. You know how you can have the people driving around in their cars and they said my daughter my son is a graduate of a Brody prep you know school you know well we have a sign on our car that says my son is a star you know so so <laughs> we think that that's pretty wonderful um greg started to bring the my guides to me he introduced me to um 
well, there must be about seven or eight of them that I talked to on an ongoing basis. And I remember dreaming about them. And they were called, and I remember the words coming right up in my, in my vision again during my dream. And it said, the ancients. And that's what they called themselves. And since then, I've come to know that Jesus is one of those ancients. You know, I, like I said, was never a religious person. Um, but he is one of my guides. And I speak to him on an ongoing basis on a regular time. And he'll give me advice. I've been up, I've been up to where he holds his counsels. You know, I've seen Gabriel, the uh, archangel, come to me. It's just been absolutely amazing. Some of it is quite biblical. I don't know why it is, but it just has come that way to me. Of all the people you would think that that would never happen to would be me, but it has been quite biblical that way. Um, and uh, I was told actually by Suzanne Giesman one time when I called in to one of her shows and asked why these people were representing themselves so biblically to me. And she said, well, that's happened to me too. But she says, it's usually because that way, when they talk to you, you know for sure who they are. Okay. And that's what Sanaya had said. You have no doubt that when they're talking to you, that it's true and it's real. And that's what Greg used to say to me all the time, because I had a really hard time believing all this was happening. He said, dad, it's all real. It's all true. You know? I remember early on too, when Greg came to me initially, he wanted to show me where he came from and how he traveled and that there was a portal that was actually coming down from the heavens down to our bedroom. And I would actually travel in this portal with him to the center of the Milky Way to where the black hole was. And he would say to me, this is how I get through to this side of the universe, Dad, through the black hole. And I said, Greg, how can you possibly travel through a black hole? He says, nothing can get through a black hole except love. Love can travel through everything. And he says, it can't be destroyed. And it is, you know, you know how some people say, what is the formula for everything. Like Einstein used to think, if only he could have one formula that would describe everything, then that would be, you know, just miraculous. And I've been told that that, you know, is truly love. And love is what everything runs on, you know, in this uh, universe. And that it is what creates, you know, all this beautiful experiences and it can't be destroyed and it's what allows the consciousness to go on forever is this love and you know once i started to get that and start to understand my it's just so beautiful you know it, it was unbelievable but i tried to get through this black hole 50 times while i was up there and i couldn't and greg said to me you can't get through because you're still in body form he says you have to be in spirit in order to be able to travel to the other side and into the other dimension so I thought, wow, this is so neat. He said, what I'm showing you, Dad, is just the tip of the iceberg. I remember him, you know, Sue was still down one time. And we were sitting in the car, and she started to cry all of a sudden. And Greg came through to me instantly while I was sitting in the car driving. And he said, don't be sad. Rejoice. Now, who would ever think that if your son had passed away or your daughter had passed away, that they would actually tell you to rejoice? You know, that it would be something so beautiful. And that's why I say to people, it's something that it was absolutely the most horrific thing that ever happened to me. And it was also the most beautiful thing that's ever happened to me. Yes, I lost my son in the physical and I can't throw my arms around him and I can't hug him anymore. And he was a great hugger, you know, but I can tell you that what he has shown me from the other side and how beautiful it is, it's just absolutely beyond words. You know, and it's just changed me absolutely for the best. You know, I remember coming out one time and talking to Susan and she said, you know, Bill, he saved you, you know, and he did. Greg saved me, you know, because I didn't know what I wanted to do down here anymore. I didn't want to live, you know, and he saved me, you know, and I thought I was going to save him, you know. No, it turned out to be exactly the opposite. And I know that I owe him so much. And if you want to talk about love, that is truly what love is all about. You know, 
to make that kind of a sacrifice, to come down here to be my son. You know, he did what he had to do. He was highly advanced. I know that now. And he left early, you know, and I couldn't believe that he was gone because it was everything to me, you know, and, you know, to realize that someone loves you so much that they would actually do that for you and save you in that way, you know, and he's opened my eyes to, you know, all of this beautiful, beautiful existence that exists down here. You know, it's uh, amazing, you know, how, you know, I can go out and play with Greg. So many times he'll come just to play with me. We'll be swimming in a pool. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was out in space with him on the space station. We were weightless together and we were jumping up and down and laughing together and just having just a wonderful time. You know, he does that on a regular basis. You know, we we think uh, Gronkowski looks a lot like Greg if Greg was pumped up, you know, and uh you know, he's a big NFL football player. Greg comes to me looking like a football player, all pumped up, you know, and I laugh my head off. You know, he, he'll bring, you know, his favorite bands to me, you know, and we'll sit there and we'll play music together. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on. I spend more time playing with my child, Greg, than I ever did while he was here on this earth. And it's just a really beautiful thing. You know, what did I get out of all of this? You know, he's, he has shown me spirit animals. He has shown me all about chakras. You know, it's just endless numbers, ancient writings, pyramids. It goes on and on and on. I'm getting the full meal deal down here with him. It's just been mind boggling. And the hardest thing for me to have done is to actually believe that it's all happening. And he keeps saying to me, believe. And my guides keep saying to me, believe it's all real it's all true i learned about the importance of meditation you know i've started to med i meditate every day now for a half an hour you know i do the breathing i relax it's really easy for me to empty my mind and the minute i can empty my mind my guides can come through greg can come through i do automatic writing i listen to greg he talks to me all the time i realize now it's all about love it's all about oneness. We are all the same down here. Nobody is any different than anybody else. It doesn't matter. And that's coming from a person who was judgmental and racist, okay? And I am not that way anymore. And that was because I was raised that way, you know? I just look at people now and I see the goodness in them. It's amazing the good people that come to me. You know, like you, Elizabeth, you, Irene, you know? coming into my world, it's, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have imagined it. You know, I find Greg coaching me all the time on my journey. He's teaching me how to be joyful. He's teaching me how to be grateful just in the little things in life. You know, the fact that you're wake up every morning, the fact that there's beautiful skies out there, the fact that we got a wonderful snowfall today, you know, little tiny things. It's just absolutely amazing. You know, and to realize and be told before you are on your deathbed that you are eternal. I never, ever even imagined. I used to say to Susan, I am so pissed off because I am no better than an old rusty Coke can in a garbage dump. I am going to be here one minute as a conscious being, and then I'm going to be dead, and that's it. And I feel ripped off. You know, I used to say that. You know, and for Greg to tell me and show me that I am forever, that I am love, that I am light and I am eternal. What a gift. It's the most beautiful thing that I have ever been shown, ever been told. And to know that he is there and he is with me and that I can reunite with him again someday and all my loved ones. He has brought my dad to me, you know, and my dad has made amends to me and I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. You know, my dad touched me. I have given Greg massages in his, in his, um, cause he used to come over here and I used to give good massages to his back. And I never got to do that before he passed. He came one night to me and let me give him a massage. You know, I can feel him. I can touch him. It's just absolutely amazing. We have now, you know, started to, um, start, we've started helping parents heal in Calgary. We started that in October. That was at the urging of Greg. I was doing a meditation and Greg said to me, dad, 
you always wondered how you were going to give back. Well, you know how you can give back? You can start up a chapter in Calgary of Helping Parents Heal. And it's absolutely wonderful, you know, to be able to do that and share that with people. You know, um, if we can get through, like I said, to one person, it's absolutely amazing, you know, that they can understand that their children are still here. They always will be. And, you know, um, you haven't lost them. They're just in a different place, a different they're just in a different level of energy than we are right now. We are down here doing a story. We are here to raise our vibration. And I used to think I'd have to come back and do it all over again because I wasn't getting it. But Greg made sure that I got it. And I'm so happy I did because maybe I don't have to come back because this is a tough place, boy. You know, the lessons down here are learned through hard knocks, you know, and you have a choice when you have those hard knocks. Are you going to take the high road? Or are you going to take the low road? You know, and if you take the high road and you use love and you lose oneness and you know you're eternal and you raise your vibration, it can only help everybody else who you're connecting with. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm going to just sign off here and I'm going to read you something that Greg downloaded to me on January the 31st, three days ago. Okay. He, I was doing my meditation and I was laying there on the floor. And he started talking and I got up and I wrote this down. Dad, I am thrilled that you are going to be making a presentation about what we have experienced together. It is what I envisioned from the moment we started to talk to each other from across the veil. You have learned so much. And I am so proud of you for having made the choice to embrace all I have been able to show you. We are very aware that you are now on earth to fulfill your mission, the purpose to show others how they can find more peace in this most challenging of circumstances by embracing the wisdom you have received, to surrender to all that is for the purpose of raising your light and vibration, to assist others who are still trapped in the darkness of their suffering, to bring relief to others by making them aware that what you think and what you feel are the most important accomplishments to be pursued to find joy in the midst of hardship, to find peace in the suffering, and to know that it is possible to live in a manner that brings happiness and gratitude, no matter the circumstances. This is not easy to learn, but once you get it and believe it and trust it, it is all real and all true. And you can then be an example for others to help raise their light and vibration as you have done. Mom gets it, Kristen gets it, Share this with others as it is time and you are ready to help others shine more light on their darkness. It is a frame of mind and it is what God wants for all of us to be a bright and shining light for all, for all to see and to emulate. And that's it. Oh, Bill, that was absolutely beautiful. I see people clapping. That was just so, um, I, I, I can't tell you how, wonderful this makes me feel to be able to hear you talking about Greg and this incredible relationship that you have with him, even being able to hug him and to touch him and to give him a massage. And this is what all of us aspire to. I know Susan does as well, but she, again, she gets to live vicariously, vicariously through you. Um, I just want to tell you a few of the things that people are saying in the chat box. Um, Andrea is saying, love the honesty, so important. This is in the beginning. Uh, Gordine is saying, I love the honesty too. It was beautiful to be able to hear that you are not, you're not somebody who was enlightened and understood this from the very beginning. It's something that you were able to learn after Greg passed and he helped you learn that. Um, Andrea is saying, Billy, you are amazing. So glad that you are speaking about this. Um, my son told me in a reading to stop saying how wonderful he is, which is, I think, is very cute. Um, uh, Carla says, such raw emotions that we all go through, our stories may be different. However, trying to navigate through the tsunami of emotions the very, um, the sa very same way, Bill, your honesty is resonating with so many of us. Gordine is saying, what a wonderful story, so inspiring and encouraging. Sherry's saying, what a blessing. Teresa's saying, this is wonderful. Gordina's saying, yes, this is a blessing and it's wonderful. Susan's saying, my dog's name is Yoda. My son named him, which I think is really very sweet. 
Um, Nancy's saying so beautiful. Um, Teresa is saying, I want to dream visit so much. And I know that all of us want to be able to be experiencing what you're doing. Maybe you need to start a, a course that we can all follow. Um, let's see, Andrea is saying, yes, the Omni Force, a great place to be. Uh, Teresa is saying, that is awesome. My son is a star. So I think that we all identify with that. Um, then also, um, Andrea is saying, in my reading, they said that my son is in the Omni Force after I, I asked if he was close to God. So she's kind of experiencing similar things to what you're uh, experiencing. You were talking about the fact that we, you owe Greg so much. Uh, Teresa was agreeing and saying, I think we owe our children a lot, which I love hearing that because I know that they're all guiding us. And when we realize and surrender and understand that they are helping us on this journey to be able to advance and grow, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> uh, and then Gordine says, uh, they do in so many ways save our lives by leaving their bodies. Um, Teresa's saying, I feel Larry rides with me in the car. Uh, Andrea's saying, so thankful for this group and Bill, a blessing to have this. Um, and Gordine, I agree, so great to have each other. Mary's saying, your story fills me with so much hope and joy. You are so blessed with such a loving son. Thank you. Um, Teresa's saying, keeping doubts out is hard but important. Um, and then Naomi is saying, thank you so much. I needed to hear your story, Naomi from Calgary. So she must be a part of your group, which is wonderful. Um, and Heidi saying, Bill, you are so inspiring. Um, let's see, Teresa saying, thank you for starting the group, the Calgary group, obviously. Um, Irene is saying, Bill, this is so poignant. I think Bill is my favorite speaker. Thank you, Bill. We can't all feel, uh, we can all feel the love that you are expressing, which is true. That was just beautiful. Barb is saying, so very inspiring, Bill. Thanks for tonight. Um, Gordine saying, Irene is so, so good to listen, just so good to listen to. Joyce, I agree. Irene, absolutely love this. Nancy, ah, Greg saved Bill. Now Bill is saving us, which is a beautiful way to express this. Gordine, thank you, Bill, so very much. My heart is so much lighter. Iris is saying, what a gift you are to all of us, Bill. Teresa, thank you so much, Bill. Heidi, wow, overwhelming. I, I mean, there, it, this goes on and on. Um, Amelia is saying, wow, amazing communication and a relationship. Thank you for speaking to us. Andrea is saying, can you come back, please? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, beautiful and so emotional. I think I skipped some here. Sherry saying, thank you for sharing your amazing story. Babette is saying, amazing and wonderful, Bill. Um, thank you so much. Carla, what a blessing to hear you speak. Valentina, overwhelming. Um, and then um, Rick is saying, believing what you know to be true is so very challenging. Thank you for the reminder. Peace and light to you as you continue your journey, sharing your gift. Um, and then Babette is saying, when you talk to Greg, do you actually hear his voice? I um, Maybe, maybe we could end with that question. Is that something that happens to you or how is it that you, is it through automatic writing? Is it through these visions that you get or do you hear his voice? Well, I'm, when, I, when I don't have anything running through my head and I've managed to learn how to do that. So Susan will often ask me, what are you thinking about Bill? And I say, absolutely nothing. That allows them to come through, you know? And I have really, tried very, very long to, to learn to do that, you know, but I hear, I hear words and I automatically, like Sue will be talking and all of a sudden Greg will say something and he has us laughing many times because he's so funny, you know, and I will just say, you know, what Greg just said, and I'll go boom, boom, boom. And, uh, you know, so I hear him. And when I write, I just have the words come down and 
I write them down as he as he talks, you know, and so it's just not Greg. There's quite a few that do that with me. And, you know, it's a really beautiful thing. Like Greg said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. He can't wait till I'm there. He says, I want to show you around, you know, and uh, I can hardly wait too. I know it's not my time yet. And I'm going to be down here for quite a while still. But when I get on to the other side, I am going on a big vacation with him and he's going to show me the universe, you know, and it's a beautiful place, you know. So, you know, we're, we're down here just learning and, and loving and that's. And really they are do. home. Yes, we are still in school. Exactly. So Trina's saying so amazing. And Lori is saying, and I love this. Thank you. I'm going to sleep now to see my son Cirrus. Oh, <laughs> So I, I think that's a great way to, to end this. I, I want to just remind everyone that we um, have unmuted you. So if you can unmute yourselves and say thank you and goodbye to Bill. This was so and wonderful, Bill. Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Bill. Yes. Yes. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For all being here too. Please come back tomorrow, Pauline. And thank you all for being here. It was a wonderful evening.